we're now going to start the next session, building integrated rail networks. And this is really important because high-speed rail is not the only thing we need. We, to have a complete transportation system, as I talked about yesterday, we need several layers of rail. We need bicycles. We need walkable communities. And we need all of it upgraded and designed and working together so that the customer and the passenger can get through the system with ease. And that's really the point. And so this panel is going to go into details about that. So I'm just going to introduce the moderator, and then he's going to bring the panel up and, and have a nice discussion. Um, Peter Gertler is the moderator. He's the senior vice president for HNTB. He's, he's one of our executive committee members, and he's been a great supporter of, the, of our, our coalition and our association. I won't read his whole bio, but I do want to say that he is a great leader in the rail space. He's been that for many, many years. And with that, please welcome Peter Gertler. Hi, everybody. What a great session, right? Let's give it up for Andy and Edward so far. We're not done yet. Um, first, before I introduce the panel, which I have a great panel, I'm excited to get started in our conversation, is a little public service announcement. Uh, there is no free lunch. This lunch took effort, took uh, some uh, contributions by others, and being in this great facility, the logistics, the effort to do this required um, contributions. And many of you here are our members, but there are many new people here, and we really want to encourage everyone to become a member of this coalition. Uh, HNTV has been a member of the coalition since day one. Uh, we saw the need for a very focused advocacy lobbying group uh, dedicated to high-speed rail. We're all members of a various professional associations, be it APTA, REMA, ASHTO, whatever. We can go through the alphabetic list, but they are not able to have a laser focus on what our interests are, which is what we're doing today. HNTV has benefited from the efforts and the labor and the, the leadership from Andy and Ezra, uh, both nationally in terms of where we are with the federal grant programs that we heard from Amit a few minutes ago, from the, from the administrator a few minutes ago, um, and also in California specifically. Many of us are involved in California. The, um, the coalition really did an amazing effort to, uh, as you may know, the history of what was happening in California, that it needed a focused effort to push it through our legislature to get the funding that we needed to, to continue. So I just I want to encourage every one of you here today that either our members pay your dues or two, if you're not a member, please pay your dues. If you have any questions about what it means to be a member, the value of being a member, you can reach out to me at any time at this conference or um, off, offline at some point. Okay, and Matt, let's get on with this amazing panel we have today. Um, at first, my great pleasure of introducing Andy Byford. Well, I love the idea that we can refer to him. Uh, the New York Times referred to him as train daddy. So aren't we lucky? So uh, he's an executive VP of uh, high-speed rail for Amtrak, an extensive career with Toronto Transit, New York MTA, and Transport for London. Andy? Great stuff. Well, thank you, Peter. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be in a room where everyone agrees on the same thing, right? We all love high-speed rail. We all are very excited about the uh, potential for high-speed rail. And certainly, uh, when I was considering, once I finished at TFL, I was considering which um, which option I wanted to uh, adopt in coming back to uh, coming back to the US. Uh, Amtrak was the uh, compelling choice, A, because uh, it's such an American icon. It truly is an iconic uh, institution. It's America's railroad, uh, but also because we have this golden opportunity, uh, which is why we're all here today. And do you have the clicker? It seems to have disappeared. Oh, there it is. Okay, so let's get into it. Um, so I think it is genuinely a new era for transit. So I just want to take you through a, through a few slides today um, and uh, just make that point. So first of all, some quick facts. You'll know Amtrak, uh, America's railroad. Um, and we are in an expansive mode. That's what uh, uh, drew me to the organization. It's great to come somewhere where for once we do have a golden opportunity. We've got the money. Uh, there's this absolute impetus, which we've heard about this morning, about um, going to the next level and truly making high speed and other improvements uh, uh, a, um, a reality for this great nation. And certainly, uh, we're very focused on that, which is why you can see the stats there of the as is, uh, but uh, we're rebuilding, we're bouncing back after uh, the impact of COVID. And this gives you just a snapshot of uh, the year in review. So uh, we're rebuilding our ridership. What really encourages us as an organization is it's not just getting back the people who were already riding on Amtrak, our loyal customers, uh, but you can see there, 7 million first time riders. That's really encouraging that we're building a new uh, ridership base. We want to do more of that. So you can see we're adding uh, service. We're restoring service. We're, we're about to, uh, later this year, we're restore service to the Gulf Coast and, and expanding um, more uh, other services that we've already got. And to, for that, we need more people. So we're hiring a lot of people uh, right now and advancing major capital projects using the IIJA, IIJA which we heard about earlier on. 
Uh, our top priorities are those on the screen, rebuilding that business again, rebuilding after uh, the ravages of COVID and getting back to not only where we were, but pushing on uh, in this uh, brave new era uh, for railroading in the US, modernizing our assets, making it even more attractive uh, for our riders so that we can attract more riders. Um, and also, this is the critical point. You heard it from the administrator. We can't do all this on our own. We've got to uh, lean on and, and rely on and work together with uh, states and other uh, partners such as yourselves in order to make this thing uh, a reality. Um, and it is a, an exciting time because, again, as we heard from sec the uh, administrator earlier, uh, we have this unprecedented amount of funding available, uh, an unprecedented amount. Look at the stats, 66 billion is more than all the 51, it says on the slide now, 52 years of Amtrak combined. So that's a huge opportunity uh, that Congress, uh, this administration have given us. And not, we doesn't need to say we have all that cash in the bank. We don't suddenly have this uh, war chest for, upon which we can draw straight away uh, for all the suppliers in the room. Um, but it does mean we've got 22 billion to, um, to push on in improving and upgrading our existing asset base. And the Delta 44 billion is drawing down via uh, FRA grants, discretionary grant programs, and that's where the, um, the, the role of uh, partners such as the states come in. But as the administrator said, and I quote, it's our moment. Uh, and these are exciting times, so I just want to run a quick video, uh, first of all, if uh, you might run the video. Uh, let's see uh, how we see it uh, from the Amtrak perspective. For more than a century, people in America move by rail. They travel faster here than anywhere in the world. 140,000 miles of track, connecting cities from coast to coast. But somewhere along the way, our transportation policies got us stuck in traffic. Not anymore. Thanks to Congress and the administration, a once-in-a-generation investment in rail is beginning. And Amtrak is ready. We're rolling up our sleeves to get to work to transform our transportation system, adding service, putting new routes on the map with state and federal partners to connect thriving cities and towns, building stronger and more resilient infrastructure, introducing a new state-of-the-art sustainable fleet made in America modernizing our stations and making them accessible to all, connecting us with the people we love and the communities that bring us together. We're creating a greener transportation network and we're growing the economy while we're at it, powered by thousands of new good jobs. The stakes are great, the potential limited only by our collective will to act, to deliver on the promise we make to future generations that we will leave this place better than we found it. The new era for rail has begun, join us. So two things stood out for me from that video. They were number one, uh, where uh, at the start it said, well, we used to have the fastest trains in the world. Well, we should be aiming to get back to that, right? The second thing, and again, I quote, which was where my colleague there said, uh, the potential is limited only to our collective will to act. And that to me is the key point. Do we want this or don't we? Because if we do want it, then we all have to pull together and really go for it. So it's time to get to work. Uh, and that's exactly what we're doing under the uh, leadership of our CEO, Stephen Gardner. Uh, and I talked earlier about modernizing our assets and serving more people, uh, uh, again, to hit those climate and mobility needs. So what does that mean? Well, uh, in terms of modernizing the assets, uh, basically uh, looking at all of our existing assets and, and modernizing them to bring them truly up to date to be in the 21st century and to comply with ADA. So, so wonderful facilities such as the Moynihan Train Hall, which I had the pleasure of using for the first time only recently, uh, that's the way of the future, you know, state of the art, uh, decent, modern uh, infrastructure, new trains, uh, fleets such as the soon to be deployed Aeros, which uh, in addition to being dual mode, will have the advantage, you don't have to have this time consuming switch between uh, electric and diesel traction at DC. And infrastructure, uh, often the sort of unsexy stuff, the stuff you don't really read about, which is uh, upgrading your switches, your, pot, your um, signals, your bridges, your tunnels, the things that make a journey reliable, you've got to get all that kind of stuff right. Um, and of course, we're pushing, I think, at an open door because rail is inherently a very efficient way to move people uh, in a mass transit uh, uh, context. Uh, there is really no better way uh, on, a, on a highly trafficked corridor to move lots of people uh, in, a, in a good amount of time. Plus, we already have the advantage that we're pushing at an open door in terms of the environmental front because it is the greenest, I would argue, the greenest way to travel uh, and we intend to make it greener still. So what's our vision? Well, uh, this is a very visionary map. This is something with which many of you in the room will be familiar. This is the Connects Us map. And I do stress, this is visionary. This is the kind of network that we should be aspiring to. So what you see on there uh, are the uh, dark lines, which are the existing national network, but the lighter blue lines, the turquoise lines, uh, which are um, things that really ought to be uh, taken forward, such as uh, cities like Phoenix and Louisville and, and, and uh, Nashville. They're not currently served. That's ridiculous. These are big, fast-growing cities. So this is the kind of um, uh, vision that we would like to see become a reality. But to do that, 
Again, back to my earlier point, we need the states to make that a reality. And how do they do that? Well, the administrator covered that very well earlier. You've got these uh, this $44 billion um, uh, grant uh, pot that can now be drawn down against, and the key federal programs being the means to do that. And so you'll see a lot of closed awaiting awards there. I was very encouraged that the administrator said it's not a one-off exercise, uh, that there will be other opportunities. But certainly we want to carry on working with the states to, for example, uh, push forward on the corridor identity program. But in addition to that, we're doing our own bit. It's not all about waiting for the states to act. Let's get on with it now. And this gives you an example of some of the improvements that uh, my colleagues and I at Amtrak are already working on. Things like making the NEC, the Northeastern Corridor, uh, work uh, re even better than it currently does. So tackling those um, those bottlenecks, such as the BMP tunnel, the Baltimore and Potomac tunnel, uh, upgrading se sections where the, uh, the trains could actually go a lot faster. You know, the high-speed rail improvement program in New Jersey. Let's get up to 160. Let's Let's tackle these other areas. We put in our own submissions, the bottom bullet point, we put in our own submissions for areas that should be upgraded. And it's not all about the NEC. The good people of um, Illinois and of Missouri have already benefited from an uplift of 90 miles an hour to 110. So that's the kind of thing that we've been working on. Uh, but in the meantime, of course, we're all here to talk about high-speed rail, right? So what do you need? You know the key elements, high travel demand between city pairs. You've got to have that compelling market, those comp uh, compelling city combos. Uh, you've got to have integration. You don't want to just build a high-speed rail line that doesn't connect to the existing systems. Let's get it right and make sure you've got proper integration at either end. Uh, there's the uh, obvious things of a straight right of way, limited stops. You know, the actual infrastructure is really clear for true high-speed rail. That's what you need. But I left the last two till last because you're dead in the water. You're wasting your time unless you have these two things. And they are, of course, political support. Got to have that. And you've got to have buckets of cash. And the two come hand in hand. So there's many people out there, and I've already encountered it, right, who's saying, yeah, yeah, it will never happen, won't happen in the US. There's lots of skeptics out there. One of the things I'd like to do in my job is defy skeptics, right? And uh, so that's one of the things that we aim to do it. And wh why do, why do you, might you have confidence that it can be done? Because the rest of the world's already been doing it. There were skeptics out there in France when the first TGV line went, went, went in from Paris to Lyon. People said, OK, fair enough, uh, but that's a one off. It's not going to happen. Now look at what's happening at, at, across Europe and across Asia. They've already cracked it. They figured it out how to do it. And similarly, um, you know, where people said, uh, you know, it's, it, it is only going to be one or two lines. Well, look at the way that that route, that that sorry, uh, mileage map has ramped up. You've gone from 122 miles in 1977 to 12,000 miles now and climbing. And I passionately believe that once Americans have, have experienced high speed rail um, here or abroad, and many of you have, you're obviously advocates of it. But once we've got we've cracked the mold and we've got a true high speed line going here in the US, everyone will want some other city mayors were going, uh, can we have some of that? And so that is why we've got to get this thing uh, underway. So how do we achieve it? Well, we looked at a couple of case studies. There's two classic ways of doing this. The Spanish went out and built a whole brand new, pretty much high-speed rail network. Dedicated lines, it's now 25% of their network, second only to, um, to China, and that's very impressive. The German way uh, was more incremental. So there's a lot of um, incremental development that's happened there, including overlaying high speed onto existing lines, upgrading the existing line to true high-speed capability. Um, so the good news here is, uh, you don't have to wait 10 to 12 years to get a new line built, or maybe less, or ideally less. There are lots of things that you can do in the meantime. And that's definitely the way we're progressing uh, and addressing this in Amtrak. Uh, we should be building the market for high-speed rail, and that is about getting all those four pieces on that jigsaw right. So yes, we want high-speed dedicated routes, but we're not focused uh, solely on that. There's lots that can be done uh, in the meantime. So a bit of a whirlwind tour of what we're up to at Amtrak. Uh, Stephen Gardner, the chairman, Tony Kosher, brought in a specific role of SVP High Speed Rail precisely because we're deadly serious about this. We want to work with you. Uh, and I'll end just by quoting the Secretary of uh, Transportation, no less. Pete Buttigieg said, why shouldn't Americans have the best rail in the world? Well, he thinks that. So do I. Let's get on with it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. If I introduce my panel, maybe our panel can get, up and get situated in the hot seats. Uh, also joining us today will be, uh, we've heard from already, the Secretary Tox Amashekin uh, from my great state of California. Uh, the Secretary oversees eight, eight state departments, boards and commissions, and more than 42,000 people and a, and a budget of $25 billion. Also joining us is Jim Matthews, President and CEO of the Rail Passenger Association, advocating for 4 million, pass, million pass rail passengers, and Rick Harnish, the Executive Director of High Speed Rail Alliance. You can read their full bios in your packets. Mr. Secretary, let's start with you. We've heard the national um, view and the national view from Amtrak, but California, I think, is a leader in many ways. But in particular, 
you could try to describe a little bit about California State Rail Plan and its innovation that it, it's put into that around what Andy was talking around, around a system plan. It's not an individual uh, role of one particular rail, but as a system. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's a very important place to start because hopefully you can hear me clearly. It sounds like I'm echoing just a little bit. Uh, it, we've got a sort of unique start to this effort in California because I don't think there are a lot of states. I would argue we probably are uh, the state that has a rail plan that is thinking about this the way that you just described in a very integrated way, not just uh, from the freight side, which a lot of states probably have a lot more attention that they've paid to is like our goods going to be able to move about, but the, the absolutely the passenger side as well. So it's completely woven together. We've got a plan that is uh, that's got a 2040 outlook uh, on the uh, overall passenger and freight side. Today, rough, well, roughly before the pandemic, we were averaging roughly 110, 110,000 trips, roughly 100,000 trips on the passenger side, trips, not, not total people, but trips uh, annually, right before the pandemic. And what we're proposing uh, with this visionary document is that uh, by the year 2040, uh, now only 17 years from now, uh, that we will have 10x, that we're hoping that uh, annually we will have more than a million trips by the year 2040, uh, to, I think the exact number is 120, uh, 1 million 200 thousand uh, trips happen. But I think another key part, and I showed this graphic a little bit earlier, to be able to get there, it's not just going to be able to happen on the high speed rail network, which is the backbone for this entire rail system that we want to create. Yes, um, but the way to get there um, is going to be some of the smaller, uh, if you will, inner city connections that we're going to be able to make. Uh, so this program, if you're not familiar with it, please look at, look it up. It could be a model for many other states around the country. The Transit and Inner City Rail Capital Program. Uh, since Governor Brown was able to get this uh, program set in place, the governor before my current boss, Governor Newsom, uh, since its inception, uh, almost $10 billion since 2015. $10 billion being spent on everything from uh, high-speed rail projects to smaller transit uh, projects across the state. And I think, again, to achieve this overall goal, it can't just be that big spine. Without a doubt, that major spine is critical. It's important, but you have to be able to make um, uh, these other critical uh, connections across the state. And as I mentioned earlier, just this year alone, the blue and the green dots that you see there, that's $3.2 billion worth of investment just in 2023 alone. And very critical to note that the 171 mile segment of the California high-speed rail that's currently under construction in the Central Valley uh, is the segment that you see in orange uh, there from Merced in the north to Bakersfield in the south. Uh, that area alone, again, since 2015, uh, $1.2 billion uh, to 11 projects. So again, it's going to take a, a very comprehensive outlook on being able to make rail come back like uh, Andy, like uh, what you're describing. If you want to have the mode shift that we're all hoping for, I think one of your slides mentioned mode shift. If we're going to have that, it's going to take uh, a, a sort of very regional, uh, very sort of holistic, comprehensive outlook. I believe in California, we're ahead of um, a lot of states in doing it. The only place that could possibly compare or compete is probably in the Northeast corridor where um, uh, some of the investment's been happening for uh, for a long time. But very proud of our efforts and uh, look forward to seeing how uh, the federal government can continue to help us uh, fill this out with all the state investment that we're making already. Thank you. Um, and also just a little plug that uh, we have three of the busiest interstate um, rail quarters in the country that are here in California. So. Yeah, I, I I failed to I failed to mention that even though we've had a, a little a few snafus lately related to climate change, uh, some of those lines have shut down. The Lo Low Sand Corridor, uh, which I know you're familiar with, uh, in, in the San Diego to LA part of the state, uh, due to some sea level rise issues and some erosions on the banks uh, down the way, it's actually shut down right now. But second busiest uh, passenger rail corridor in the entire country, only second to uh, the Northeast uh, Northeast Corridor. Again, it's We've had some challenges related to being able to keep it open lately, uh, but it is no doubt uh, one of the uh, prime sort of passenger rail routes in the entire country. And another uh, key route that uh, Amtrak also helps us with is the Capital Corridor, right. which I ride very often. It connects Sacramento uh, to the Bay Area. I'm on it uh, at least three or four times a month just to be able to, again, showcase and show people now that this system actually works. When I have a meeting in the Bay Area, Instead of you know staff driving or somebody, I'm I'm on Amtrak, wow. headed down from Sacramento to uh, uh, to to the Bay Area. So not two of the busiest uh, corridors in the entire country in, in California. Great, um, Andy. If I can ask you to take off your Amtrak hat, 
Yeah. I know it's been newly fitted, yeah. so, but, uh, and you're bringing it to your global experience um, of the United States is unique in many ways. And these other pictures and the slides you showed with the other countries, it was a national effort to um, bring high-speed rail you know, in Spain or in Asia. Interesting in the United States, we heard today, we heard from Brightline, we've heard from California and other states and Amtrak. So we have three models, business models in the United States, which are the, is an Amtrak model and a, a sort of a semi-national model. There's a state supported system like we're doing in, it, uh, in California and other states. Um, and then there's the private model. Do you see that as being a, an opportunity, something unique about the United States and our ability to deliver um, high-speed rail different than how it's been done in other places? Sure. Oh, I mean, I think um, I think it certainly does present an opportunity. And uh, let's say Brightline is an example. Brightline have had huge success at getting their operation up and running in, in what's not always an easy regulatory uh, or legislative environment. So I think sometimes you, you let people play to their strengths. I mean, obviously, as an Amtrak um, a, a a employee, rather, and as a, um, a believer in a national system, I think that we're very good at um, operating. Uh, and I, I think that what can be done in, uh, successfully in the future is combinations where people play to their strengths, uh, where you might have, for example, a, an entity that is particularly good at raising the capital, getting the environmental assessments, getting the, um, getting the legislative uh, permis uh, enabling uh, permissions, et cetera. Um, and then maybe Amtrak has a part to play either directly in terms of running the service or uh, working in partnership with that other entity to at least provide uh, through ticketing and common signage and good uh, interconnection between uh, systems if they are separate systems. What you don't want to do is end up with a sort of uh, a patchwork quilt of uh, different uh, operators where, where there's just no interaction because that is not customer facing. If, for example, you didn't have intermodal um, connections or if you didn't have in, inter um, operative ticketing, uh, we really don't want to go down that route. So, you know, as Amtrak, we, we're very supportive of uh, other entities. Uh, ultimately, we, we're all in this for the same reason, right? We all want what's best for the customer. We all believe in rail. We all believe in the, in the future of rail, how it's delivered. And I would say we're sanguine about it, but uh, we're, we're flexible and open to working in, in partnership form with different uh, bodies. But um, certainly, uh, as long as we keep our eye on the end goal, and the end goal is that truly integrated uh, transit system, then we're on the right track. That's great. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to move over to Jim. Jim, you have a, you know awesome uh, responsibility of uh, representing 40 million um, rail passengers, making sure that they're safe and have reliable and convenient um, uh, experiences. Uh, where do you see the greatest opportunity for Amtrak, um, you know, as a national in developing a national passenger network? Well, I think you know Andy really kind of hit it right. There's, <clears throat> oops, I went off there for a moment. Having everyone play to their strengths, I think, is is the key, right? Um, I mean, and one of the strengths that Amtrak has and the existing national network has uh, is political support. Uh, and you know, we heard um, Dr. Pearl say this morning that. We have this, this situation where what we really need is policy innovation rather than technology innovation. And that is kind of where we're at. Uh, this slide, uh, this goes back to 2018. Um, this is an example of a uh, political coalition that we had been able to build uh, when the national network was threatened. Uh, and this was uh, during the Trump administration, there was a, a threat to basically undo service to, 20, to, to er basically everywhere you see on the map uh, that's, that's in red. Um, that would have been 220 cities on 140 million people who would have lost service. Uh, because of that, we were able to activate a congressional coalition, uh, which wound up including 95 senators. And uh, we were able to, to mobilize the Congress to, to save the national network. And I want everyone to think about this for a moment. Uh, we hear the sort of, I'll almost call it a meme, that Republicans don't support rail and that Democrats do. 95 senators supported a sense of the Senate resolution that we should have a long distance network in the United States. And that was when it was being led by the Republicans. So this is an example of the kind of political strength that you can build on. And I think that's really an important element for folks to recognize that this coalition and this strength is what you need to advance to high speed coalition and strength. Because right now, we don't have that. And I wish I could say that we did. Uh, but we've been part of this coalition for 30 years. It's been fighting to get this done. And we don't have that yet. Um, we, uh, working with US High Speed Rail, um, we're working to support um, Senator Ossoff's letter, uh, sign-on letter. Um, I can tell you that we were pretty happy with the results, but we did not get 95 senators. <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact, I think it was nine where we wound up. 
Um, so that's great, that's progress, but that's not where we need to be. This, ex the existence of this service and the benefits that it provides to millions of Americans every day, that is a way to, to get Americans used to the idea of trains as a utility rather than trains as a novelty. And once you do that, that creates the political preconditions that you need to, to build a high-speed coalition. In the meantime, a lot of the work has been done. Um, this is just one sample map, but there's several out there. Uh, we were uh, able to participate in the Federal Railroad Administration studies a few years ago around the regional uh, high-speed rail planning. Now, this is long-term visioning, um, but this network in the Southeast that you see here, this is notional. It requires a lot of, of further work. FRA will tell you that. Um, so let's put that big asterisk on it. However, the initial assessment of this network showed that above the rail, this network, as, con as configured here, would more than cover its costs. Um, that's a pretty remarkable thing. So the other remarkable thing is that this is a political map as well as a service map. This was the result of a collaboration among state DOTs that were part of the regional rail planning process. So now you have a vision that was at least bought into by the state DOTs in these territories where this would operate. So that's a really important point, right? We can sit and talk all day about how much we want this to happen. And I'm absolutely one of those people. Um, and I'm super excited to, to finally get a chance to, to ride a fast train when I get on Bright Line West in, in 2028. I'm absolutely excited to go ride the California High-Speed Rail. That's gonna be great. And those are gonna be excellent vehicles for showing Americans what's possible. But in the meantime, they have to get something right away for the bipartisan infrastructure law money that they voted for. They have to see some tangible benefit. We can't wait until 2030, 2035, 2063. We have to show something now. Um, and so that's where the existence of Amtrak and the success of Amtrak creates the preconditions for greater public support and awareness of the value of a high-speed network. Thank you. Um, hey, Rick. Um... You and I have been in the trenches for decades uh, fighting the battle. Rick is a evangelist, a subject matter expert, and uh, uh, has been fighting the hard work about uh, with the building of his coalition or the High Speed Rail Alliance, a uh, founding member of that. Uh, Rick, you have been introducing a new lexicon to how we talk about high speed rail in terms of um, and networks. And I was wondering if you wouldn't mind just explaining how we should be thinking around integrated networks. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we've, we've, for a long time had a frustrating conversation about high speed rail versus higher speed rail versus are we focused on city pairs or are we focused on and part of the reason for that is that railroads are incredibly versatile and they're kind of like lego sets where you get the box and it's got a picture on the box and you can build it that way but you can also build it other ways depending upon what your personal needs are and so railroads are very flexible in being able to say well we've got these existing assets and these existing needs how do we make that work so it makes it very hard to have a conversation so um, we have been working to create a way of talking about this in a much more simplified manner. And we call that the integrated network approach, where the network piece of that discussion um, is the very important piece. Um, so uh, uh, in, in, in later presentations, if folks want, I can get into the other parts of the woods. But the description of why network planning is so critical hopefully conveys through these points. Um, and it ends up to why this very uh, innovative and revolutionary state rail plan that California has put together really needs to be replicated across regions, across the nation as a national plan, down to regional plans, down to state plans, and down to MPO level plans. So we frequently talk about high-speed rail as city pairs. Um, there's a lot of reasons that that happened. Uh, trains do, in fact, excel well um, in markets where the cities can be within three hours. Um, you can run really frequent service between big cities. Uh, so in one case, Chicago and Indianapolis seems like an excellent place to start. It's only 180 miles, so physically it's easy to do. Cross flat land, no tunnels. Um, but maybe Chicago and Indianapolis on their own don't quite justify it. But certainly it's a great place to get started. Um, so there's a lot of talk about Chicago to Milwaukee, Chicago to Rockford. There's been discussions about Indianapolis to Muncie Transit Service. Um, this map is simplified. There have been discussions about Chicago, Indianapolis, Cincinnati, but unfortunately, most of our planning has been done independently. And so you don't have a lot of opportunity in that to use the system if you're the user, because if you're in Cincinnati, well, we're really only talking about Indianapolis, or if you're the person trying to decide how much infrastructure to invest, there's not a lot of market there. 
But if you start to add up all the potential ways that people can use the system, now you've got a lot more volume on everything. And since frequency is so critical to making public transit work, it could be a bus from Indianapolis to Muncie, but because the volume is there, maybe it's an hourly bus instead of just a couple of trains a day, which makes that bus much more useful. Instead of Indianapolis to Cincinnati being three or four trains a day at 80 miles an hour, maybe it's a regional line where the trains are every two hours, every hour, um, at an average speed of 70 miles an hour, a top speed of 125. But that key piece in the middle there, Chicago to Indianapolis, which today is five and a half hours, on a shared use line, it should be three and a half hours, um, but with a high-speed line, that takes that down to 90 minutes. And now you've cut um, 90 minutes off the Cincinnati to Milwaukee time because there's a high-speed line in the middle. Uh, so we really need to start thinking about building coalitions around networks instead of city pairs. And that's kind of the foundational uh, notion of what we're promoting. And to go back to the California plan, um, this is in the 2018 rail plan document, not in this format. We, we pieced it together a little differently. So those are listings of counties from north to south, up to down. Um, and those lines are the total rail or Amtrak bus um, usage between those counties. Um, and I wanna point out that Fresno shows no traffic on this, but that's only to make the lines work at the other side. Fresno is actually compared to most cities in the Midwest to fairly busy train stations. So I uh, just wanna point that out. Uh, they did a comparison and they did everything as standalone projects with everybody going in their own direction the way they were prior to 2018 big, big increase in ridership and really definitely worth doing. But if you coordinate the system and make it um, work together as a whole with a single ticket anywhere in the state um, and other making sure that the buses and the trains all meet at each other at the same time so you can use the system. Um, in my version, you can't see that county. I forgot what the name of the county is up there um, in Northern California um, where there's nothing showing up in the standalone projects, but up there you've got real usage going up into Northern California, that's a bus line. So the making the system work at the bottom brings enough volume that you improve the bus service to Northern California in order to make that a truly viable option for that part of the state. Um, and that brings a lot more political coalition into it because now if we are talking about statewide networks, regional networks, we're bringing a lot more uh, people into the discussion. So that's that's the integrated network approach in a nutshell. Great, thank you. I just want to emphasize something that Rick pointed out. I mean, this is this is the math that drives the public policy win here. And I think as a as a as a coalition, as a community, we have not done the best job of selling that to policymakers and helping them understand that. I mean, look at the combination of Texas Central through an interline agreement being able to sell tickets to Amtrak passengers. That alone, just that Dallas Houston link creates 12,256 possible trip combinations once you throw the Amtrak network into it. That's an incredibly powerful thing. So it's not about going from Houston to Dallas. It's about making 12,256 different types of trips possible with the same set of equipment, the same infrastructure. That's the power of it. Great. Um, one last question and I'll open up to the audience. Mr. Secretary, you brought up in your earlier presentation around equity, how important that is in California. And I would imagine the nation I know it's it's part of the, the rail plan uh, as well. And I think some of the messaging that you were talking about um, is true. We've been talking about high-speed rail to get from Houston to Dallas or LA to San Francisco in a very short amount of time. But how does that really, what's the benefit to the other communities that don't need to get from San Francisco to LA or from Houston to Dallas? Where's the equity um, in, where's the opportunity for equity in the investment in these kind of programs to other communities so they have access um, to a world-class railway, even though they don't need to do the San Francisco to LA. Yeah, it's a little bit of it's a little bit of this integrated uh, map that Rick and and Jim are talking about. But if, let me just quickly backtrack a little bit. I mentioned early on in, in my remarks the opportunity that it's providing. Right. I think that's that's critical to to continue to emphasize as we make this push as a community. As Jim said, when you think about the Central Valley. You think about the uh, the economic status of that region um, from a sort of income standpoint and job standpoint. It's one that's been challenged. It is a easy way to uh, e easy way to put it for many many years. And the fact that this project is there, uh, the number of jobs, ten thousand jobs created, most of it to people in that region. I think that's a, an important thing to mention from an equity standpoint. First of all, to you know some, from an operation standpoint, when it actually starts when it actually starts running. Uh, 
it's not just going to be a Bay Area to LA connection that this project is going to be making. As I pointed out in the um, in the map and similar to the inner, uh, the, the the graphic that was shown a little earlier from Rick, there are connections all the way in between. And people are going to need to get to school. They're going to need to get to work um, and having an affordable way to be able to get there, which I think this system will be, um, I, I think it's going to be it's going to be vital. There's a little bit of a um, uh, an acronym that I've come up with that I'm going to start using more often to describe how the how on this. And the acronym is CARS. It's not the best necessarily acronym in the world, but CARS. And, and bear with me a, a little bit. CARS, C, convenient. Has to be uh, has to be convenient. Number uh, A has to be affordable. Uh, R has to be reliable, and S has to be safe. Real quickly on each one of those, from a convenience standpoint, it has to be connected. You have to be able to get to uh, buses that help get to key communities that we want to prioritize. So the convenience of that, if we're going to ever be able to compete with cars, that has to that has to happen. Has to be affordable. Everywhere we've been to, everybody's noted already early on today, Europe, Asia, if you're going to go from Shanghai to Beijing, it's like 15, uh, when you do the conversion, it's like 15 bucks to get from one major city um, uh, to the next. So the affordability is going to be important. Reliable, I can tell you, uh, I figured, I learned this when I was uh, in, in Japan. If the train is more than 30 seconds late in Japan, you get, a you get an apology. You get an apology, uh, either written or a call or somebody apologize for 30 seconds. I'm not going to talk about what happens in California, but I can <laughs> tell you we're nowhere near that kind of a range. Just for I use Andy's, uh, I'm not going to point fingers at Andy necessarily, but <laughs> I use the Capitol Corridor often. I can tell you we're not at a 30 second uh, time, time frame right now. Let me just say that. And then from a safety standpoint, again, the, the final thing, uh, Japan, 60 year celebration coming up zero fatalities on the entire system. In the United States right now, we're averaging roughly anywhere from 700 to 750 fatalities somewhere along our road system every year. Passenger trespassing, car getting hit by a train, something like that. So 750 roughly, uh, sink and sin, zero in 60 years. So cars, again, not the best acronym, but remember cars, I'll be talking about that more and more often. And cars in a sense of that's how many we're gonna get off the road. Got it. Uh, 400,000 plus in San Francisco uh, in, uh, when the project opens uh, in California. I think I just, uh, I think I did read an article once there at uh, Shinkansen and left 30 seconds early in Tokyo and they actually apologized to everybody for leaving early. So, um, all right, I'll open it up for questions. First, uh, let me, uh, uh, Secretary LaHood. <laughs> Without question, there should be trains to Peoria every two hours. <laughs> I apologize, Mr. Secretary. I will add that in. <laughs> what level? What level is your aspiration to become the provider of service to new uh, coming online high-speed rail? Um, well, first of all, Secretary, it's really nice to see you again. We want, uh, I, so I had the pleasure of serving on a panel under you in uh, New York, uh, which, which brings back very many happy memories. Um, our aspiration is very high, I would say. And the fact that, as I said uh, on the podium, that the chairman and the secretary, uh, sorry, the um, CEO have invested in a specific uh, SVP position, which I'm lucky enough to have, I think it's an indication of our, um, our intent and our desire to uh, make this thing a reality. So, um, but again, we're not saying that that's the only uh, aspiration. You, you, you do these things incrementally. There's lots that can be done with the existing system to make it more reliable, to make it more um, attractive to customers. But we are deadly serious about playing our part uh, with the support of Congress, with the support of uh, body, bodies such as this in uh, seeing high-speed rail become a reality in the US. And certainly for me, I would not have come here if I thought that it wasn't possible. I really genuinely think it is, and it's uh, the time is now. Thank you. Second question, please. <laughs> so my view would be, I think you have to do a bit of both. I mean, you know, ideally, we Amtrak would run over its own tracks, the freights would run over their own tracks, they'll do their things, we do ours. But realistically, you're not going to completely replicate the rail system across the whole of North America when you've got, a, a, you know, what in theory, a, it's very extensive, actually, but a perfectly viable rail um, network across the US. It's still the largest rail network in the world, actually. 
Um, but I, so I think partly it is about a new build where that makes sense, where it really does make sense for a particular combination of uh, cities with the wider network that we were just talking about, that, that there are cases where that absolutely is the right solution. In others, there's upgrading the existing route, which is what we're doing on the Northeast Corridor, taking out the bottlenecks, uh, straightening curves, uh, dealing with uh, things like the Sawtooth Bridge at Newark, you know, renewing the infrastructure. And, and in others, I think we've just got to get smarter at how we work with our colleagues. I'm not here to uh, badmouth freight operators. They've got a job to do. Sometimes the, the fault is our own because sometimes it's our own equipment that fails. Um, and even on our own track, uh, we know we need to get better where we control the infrastructure. So I think it's uh, it's a sort of a multi-headed uh, challenge that you've got to, we've got to make the existing system work better, make improvements to it and add brand new uh, dedicated infrastructure where that can be um, afforded, where we've got the political support uh, and where there's a compelling economic case. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Please. Uh, I have a question, how can we bring the public? Do you want to get, do you want to get more? Uh, well, I, I suspect Jim will have a view. I mean, certainly we've got to, We've got to make, we've got to get to a point where not just the product is attractive in terms of the reliability of the service and the relative speed of the service, but it's also got to be an attractive, attractive from a pricing point, such as people, such that people aren't, um, uh, you know, uh, tempted away or to, uh, put off by the price and tempted to just get on a plane or get into their own car. Um, and obviously, uh, economics comes to the fore. We've got, to, we can't just discount tickets to the point where we're making a loss because we are recipients of public funding. We've got to, uh, to a certain extent, cover our costs. Uh, but, but one of the ways we're doing that is becoming more um, dynamic in terms of yield management, looking at different price points. There used to be just one price point for Amtrak. There's now 15 different price points. So I think um, it, it's, it's continuing in that, uh, in that quest to uh, make us as efficient an organization as we possibly can and to better understand the market such that we can we can charge a um, a reasonable price that uh, is attractive and, uh, and gets people onto the rail network. And I did want to add something there. Um, that is a very Northeast corridor question. Um, the Acela is pretty expensive. The regionals are fairly expensive, but the distance between New York and Washington is pretty similar to the distance between Chicago and St. Louis. I can ride Amtrak from Chicago to St. Louis for as little as $28. So when we talk about the fares being high, it's it's high in some places. It's not high enough in others. Uh, I think where uh, uh, if we're off the Northeast Corridor, I think where the fares are a little bit out of hand is on the sleeper accommodations. Um, those are up more than fifty percent from their pre-pandemic levels. I think that's too high. Um, but you know, I think the idea that Amtrak is expensive is very much a Northeast Corridor view. Um, my two of my sons live in New York, and they tell me that all the time because they want to come see us here in D.C. And they say, "I can't afford it, Dad." You got to get them to lower the price. And, well, you just got to go take the train in Chicago. That you can afford. So. <laughs> you know, I think the answer is a lot more seats. So um, I would like to see Amtrak and the Federal Railroad Administration make a big priority of cranking up the production of rolling stock so that we can provide more seats so that you can run longer to sell the trains um, so that you can get to the model where you're carrying a lot of people at low fares but you're covering your fixed costs because you've got a lot of people on those trains. Big uh, amen. Yeah, so the, the, in my view, the, the policy answer is we've got to get a lot more rolling stock in production right now. And, and make years. our existing rolling stock work more reliably, and we're on that pace. Great. Well, thank you very much, panelists, and it was a great discussion. Thank you, audience. Give a hand to our panelists. <laughs>